Jesus. This morning we're talking about joy, and obviously as we sing all of our hymns this morning, the emphasis and the key theme of each is the joy of the Lord that we have. We've been celebrating the Advent season. You see the candles that are lit there each week as a reminder. These are the great themes of the Advent season of hope and joy and peace and love, and we'll look at love on Christmas Eve together. But we have hope because of the gospel. We know that this world is not our home. We have an eternity written on our hearts, and we're longing for something more. So we are looking forward uh, to what is to come. We also have the peace that comes into our heart, a peace that passes all understanding because Jesus Christ is that peace child that would give to us uh, the peace that we now have and hope for uh, in the world to come where the lion and the lamb will lie down together, where war will no longer be there, where conflict will no longer be part of what we know and have experienced in this world. And we also are going to learn about joy this morning, joy that overflows because Jesus Christ has come. And for us to think about what the Christian joy, I want to share with you a little quote here. There are no sad saints. If God really is the center of one's life and being, joy is inevitable. If we have no joy, we have missed the heart of the good news. And our bodies, as much as our, as much as our souls, will suffer the consequences. You see, the lack of joy in our life can have a physical effect upon us. We hear the word depression, and it's common, and we often talk, hear about the struggles that people have and the difficulties we may face because of the circumstances in our life. We see it all around us. We feel it. So we can see the physical effect that it has upon our lives. It also has a mental effect upon us, the lack of joy in our life. And then we think about how we suffer through those circumstances that may be difficult for us. And so this quote is to remind us of the joy that we have as Christians. It's not to say that you will always be happy. Joy is more than just happiness. For we know that there's struggle. All you have to do is read the Psalms and you're going to see that there are those who questioned the Lord and what was happening. They didn't experience joy every day. That's not what we're aiming for to say that we need to have joy in our life and we need to be Christians that express our joy. But listen to Romans chapter 15, our theme verse for this Advent season. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may bound in hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that encourages us, that does give us joy. It gives us a new perspective on how we are to live and carry out our life upon this earth. We thank you that you are able to give us joy even in the midst of the circumstances of life. And Father, I pray for those who have gathered here this morning, for those that are mourning, those who are sorrowful, those who have a downcast soul. And we thank you that your joy can break through all of that and bring us comfort. And our souls can be lifted up and that we may soar on eagles' wings, that we know that you are in control and your sovereign hand is over us and over all of creation. So we pray that we be touched by your word this morning to have a greater understanding of the joy that we have as followers in Jesus Christ. And may we give you all glory and honor. For the chief end of man is to give you glory and praise and to enjoy you forever. So we thank you that we can enjoy you here now and in the world to come. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I think we can all agree that we desire a good life. We desire the idea to be satisfied, to have fulfillment, to enjoy what this world can offer us. We desire fulfillment. We all would agree to that. I had the great joy of watching the snow fall last night and to sit there and look out the window and watch it. We did a time lapse to show the snow falling. It didn't fall fast enough to make the time lapse of any enjoyment in that sense, but we had uh, a joy in seeing that. And late at night, I took my dog out and she's a Labrador retriever and this was probably her first experience of snow. 
and the joy of trying to hold on to that leash as she would run and bound through the snow, and I enjoy that walk, the crunch of snow. When I drove out of the driveway today and I could hear the snow crunching under the tires, reminded me of my childhood, reminded me of my home, and now I sit there and embellish and relish on that sort of thing. Uh, and I delighted in that. And we have temporary enjoyment because tomorrow the snow may melt away and I might hope for it again next week, especially on Sunday. I see heads nodding, no, we don't want it, but that's okay. Uh, we need more of it. If you have a couple of feet of snow at Christmas, you'll love it. It will be beautiful. Um, but as we sit there and we think about the momentary pleasures that we have in this world and the delight, and I was calling my kids to the window and saying, come, come, look at this, and they were making fun of me out throughout the evening. But we desire, as a people, for the good life. We desire these things, and we sometimes pursue them and hope that they'll bring us the satisfaction. Listen to Steve Timmis, who wrote this. He said, everything in our culture says that we should pursue what we want. If you feel stuck in your marriage, leave it. If you want that promotion, go for it. If you don't want that baby, abort it. If you want that holiday, credit card it. Find the true desires and spend your life fulfilling them. You know you deserve it. That's what our culture teaches us. And he went on to say this, those things we demand in order to bring us the good life will disappoint us. Often we want things that are objectively good, like health and marriage and family, peace and satisfaction. But when we demand these things in order to feel happy, we are bound to be disappointed. They cannot live up to our longing because our longing is for heaven and it can only be satisfied by Christ Jesus and fulfilled in our heavenly home. So what this world will offer to us is always something more. We will desire more than what we have so we can see how we pursue all of these gadgets and things and the kingdom of kingdom rules our daily life because we think somehow that we will be fulfilled in those things, but we know if we really think about it that the reality is that eternity is in our hearts, and we long for something more, and that longing is meant to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ and him alone. The Christian faith provides lasting joy. Our world and those around us, our neighbors, experience temporary joy but they desire more. It produces in us a joy to withstand the storms of life. That's what the Christian joy brings to us, that we're able to weather the storm, we're able to see, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that when the rain and the storms came, those who had built their home on the rock, and what he meant by that was those who build their life on Jesus Christ will be able to weather anything. And it was the fool who would build the house on sand. And the Christian joy is a joy that is surrounded often by sorrow, but it's never burnt out. So we are able to see sorrow endure, uh, but joy will always pervade it. And that's the way of joy that we experience in our Christian walk. When the angel of the Lord appeared, in this passage we recite over and over again in the Advent season, Luke chapter two, verse nine, and the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, and you'll be find a baby wrapped in clothes and cloths and lying in a manger, and suddenly there appeared an angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. And in that announcement, the angels are pronouncing to us the good news that is found in Jesus Christ. You know that we get the word gospel from the Greek word that meant good news. And so the gospel message of the scriptures is good news to the world. And so the angel was saying, look, at, don't be frightened because what I offer you, the announcement that I'm giving to you will change this world forever. And it will bring hope, it will bring peace, and it will bring an everlasting joy, joy that will overflow. Joy to those who have found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the good news of the gospel that came wrapped 
with great joy. And the announcement of the birth of the Savior was what brought joy to the shepherds in the fields, to the wise men that would later follow the star, and to all who would follow after Jesus Christ. It would be our joy to know that we have the arrival of the king. If you've read C.S. Lewis in his Chronicles of Narnia, the world was cursed. It was always winter, but never Christmas. And he was telling us a little bit about what would happen in the coming of Aslan in that story, but he was giving a story or a picture of what it would be for Christ to come in this world. The world without God would be like a world always having winter and never having Christmas. Or maybe always having winter and never having summer. Or maybe always having fields and never having ocean. When we think about what God has provided for us in the coming of his son, the Savior has come into this world to reverse the curse and to find it as far as the curse is found as we sung in that first hymn, Joy to the World. That Jesus Christ has come and he's applied what he would do upon the cross to this world so he brings remedy to our problem. He brings joy to our life. And they were proclaiming the joy that is now ours because Christ has come. We've been justified in Christ. If we look at the book of Romans, that's what he's going to emphasize over and over again is how we are justified in what Jesus has done. The word justified meant that we were made right. We were, it's a lawyer's term, and it was the idea of a declaration that we would be made holy in that sense. And what Jesus accomplished for us is that we have been justified by faith in Christ and him alone. And because of our justification, we now have hope. Hope like the world doesn't know. And because of being justified, we have peace, a peace that passes understanding, a peace that the world doesn't know. And because we've been justified, we now have a joy, a joy that this world does not know. But for us as believers, for those who are Christians, we come to a greater understanding of what this joy means. I have preached a few uh, funerals in the past few weeks, and two of our members lost their husbands. And it's a great loss to lose a spouse or to lose a loved one. And we know that as a part of our experience in this world. And as I attended the funeral and met with each family, I was able to see joy even in the midst of sorrow because they had an understanding that what they were experiencing was far different than what the world sees in death. They had joy in knowing that their loved one was now in heaven and their joy is now complete, and their joy is now something that they experience for everlasting life. And that was the reason for their joy, was because these family members knew that for themselves. And those departed loved ones have finished the race, they have crossed the finish line, they are now in the presence of the Lord, and they will never experience the sorrow and the suffering that they experienced in their this world, their suffering is now replaced with an everlasting joy. Death puts joy to the test. But the one who was born in the manger that we proclaim died so that we could experience true joy. And he went through sorrow so that we could enjoy life and enjoy God. Show me a Christian who does not know joy and I will show you a Christian who does not understand what he has in Christ. William Barclay said this, we are chosen for joy, however hard the Christian way, it is both in the traveling and in the goal, the way of joy. There is always a joy in doing the right thing. When we evade some duty or some task, when at last we set our hand to it, joy comes to us. The Christian is the man of joy. The Christian is the laughing cavalier of Christ. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. And nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its connection to black clothes and long faces. And sometimes that's how the outside world looks at the believers in this world. They see sometimes that picture of that, and so the Christian is here to show a different reality. We were made to to rejoice. We were made to laugh and have joy in the presence of the Lord and the joy that we have in this world. Joy is the mark of the Christian. 
So let me reinforce some of this with some passages of scripture that you might cling to and enjoy. Psalm 32, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Maybe I could encourage you to take your Bible, and in the back, most of them will have a little uh, concordance and opportunity to look up words and see the verses that are related to it. I'd encourage you to do a little study on the Advent themes of hope, peace, and especially joy. Listen to this passage in Psalm 126. Those who sow tears will reap the songs of joy. There is that delicate balance of living in a world that's tainted by sin, that we see the sorrow around us and tears are part of our daily life and experience. But we will also rejoice. And songs of joy can be in our midst so that as we see those passing who know the Lord, and because of their passing, we can have sorrow, but we also have the joy, and songs of joy can be in our heart in knowing that. Or Nehemiah chapter eight, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and you probably have heard that verse put to song before. And when Jesus had his disciples with him in his final message and farewell to him, he talked about the joy that would be theirs because of the relationship they had with him. Joy would enable them to endure the conflict that they were about to experience. Each one of the apostles would face martyrdom because of their faith, as history tells us. That Jesus was saying that you will have joy even though the end of what you will experience in this world will be filled with suffering and persecution for his name's sake. But joy will pervade in the midst of the sorrow and joy would make them complete. Listen to what Jesus said. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. So there is a measure of joy that we can attain, and the desire from Christ is that we would have full joy in knowing him, and that we'd be able to experience it both here, but more importantly, enjoy it forever in its perfect sense of an everlasting life. Then he said in John chapter 17, but now I come to thee and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So again, he's saying the same thing that he said earlier in this passage, that our joy may be made full. And as we walk and journey through this way, this path the Lord has for us, joy can be ours and joy is ours because of what Jesus Christ has done. So no matter what circumstances we experience, no matter what comes our way, no matter what journey we might have to go through, we can rest and know that the hope and the peace and the joy and the love of God are ours and enabling us to endure. Notice what Jesus is saying. It is a joy that we can now have and it's a gift from him. It's God-given joy. Someone said this, if you want to define joy, listen to this definition. Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence today. Now, I grew up in the British Commonwealth, and so one of the things you saw at Buckingham Palace was when the flag would be raised over Buckingham Palace, it meant that the queen was there. So that's the illustration I grew up with, and it's a reminder that I have joy in my heart because of what Jesus Christ has done, and the king is here and present with us. And joy is the flag that flies over our hearts because of it. And that's a joy that this world won't be able to understand. And that's what makes us different and appealing to those that watch and see what goes on in our life. Because of the joy that we experience and we express even in the midst of great difficulty, people will notice and the Lord will even use it to advance his name. We can taste joy In our world, tastes it here and there. Our neighbors are able to experience joy because joy is a blessing that the Lord would give both to the believer and to the unbeliever. So there's joy in the neighbor's heart, but it's always fleeting. It's always never complete. It's never full and never completely satisfying. But the gospel reminds us that in Christ that we can have that true satisfaction and only found in him. And so you've heard me say this over and over again, that we are pursuing things in our life. We're trying to fill ourselves with the joy, the hope, the peace. But without Christ, it will always be in vain. It will always be empty. And it will never bring 
the true satisfaction. There will always be this longing, give me something more. It can't be found in a book, it can't be found in a vacation, it can't be found in uh, some kind of job. We're going to find it only in him and then he changes the way we look at each one of those arenas in our work and where we live and where we play. Joy is in the midst of it, even though there might be sorrow and suffering. You may experience joy in your accomplishments or in relationships, but your joy is not complete or everlasting. In this world, all of these things are passing away. And that these things that bring you joy will one day come to their end, but you'll never find true satisfaction without Jesus Christ. Joy shows us that the king reigns in our life. I want to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen to these verses of scripture that will give you hope this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you see what Peter is saying? He's writing to fellow Christians that are being persecuted in the ancient Near East, in that area of Turkey, in modern day Turkey. They were finding, uh, res- they were finding their place of rescue to be in the mountainsides and they created the caves and the catacombs if you've ever been to Turkey and gone to that area. And they would find their resting place. They, were, they would find their place of joy. They would find their place of worship in those caves as they were hunted uh, for being followers of Jesus Christ. And Peter writes them this truth, knowing that all of what they were experiencing that time, it was a rough way of living. And it was a difficult position to be a follower of Jesus Christ in that day, just as it is today for many, not in this country, but around the world where there are more persecutions of Christians today than all of uh, the centuries up until this last and to our present time. And Peter is writing them a message of hope and he's saying, look, this is what you now have in Jesus Christ. This is the relationship. And you see the Advent themes coming over and over again. And then he says this, in this rejoice greatly. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Okay, there's that tension that the scriptures are always going to give to us. We can have joy, and we're going to have temporary trials and distress and difficulties. And so often we have in part of the Christian realm, we have people who will say that that can't be true, that if you come to Christ, all your problems, all your worries and concerns are over that you'll never experience suffering again. And that is what you can hear preach. You can find it on the radio anywhere around this country, and we can find it in all around the world. We're gonna find preachers who are gonna preach a gospel that's very different than what our scriptures have just said. Notice what he's saying, that you will be able to rejoice even though now for a little while you've been distressed and in various trials. So don't let someone tell you that if you have enough faith that those things will disappear, the distresses and the worries will be gone. I've witnessed many people coming into my office who have been taught that to say, why are these things happening? The only outcome was that God must be punishing them because of the life that they have or the lack of faith that they have in their life. I remember a blind man who was seeking to be healed and I was at a business lunch and this person speaking was asking for anyone who wanted to come forward to come for healing. And so this blind man got up and he walked toward uh, this man and he laid hands on him and began to pray. And as he was walking back, he said, and if you have enough faith, then your sight will be given back to you. And that man walked back to the table, sat down beside me. His wife was holding onto his arm because he never received sight. And he had shared with me earlier that he goes to these lunch meetings all the time because he's seeking his blindness to be gone. And he was putting hope in there. And the tragedy was that that preacher told him it was because he didn't have enough faith. If he only had more of it. And we see the self-righteousness and the whole idea of works righteousness being involved in that kind of horrible message. And how many have heard that story and are wondering today if God is for them. When all we hear is the angels proclaiming that Jesus has come and God has come to you. That he didn't come for the angels, but he came to 
be for you who are unworthy, us who are the enemies of God, and now we are made friends with God, and he can be our father. That is the joy of the Christian life. So he says this, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you have not seen him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Here Peter gives these Christians who are being hunted, who are facing persecution every day, constantly looking over their shoulders, wondering if they would meet their death that day. He gives them this message and tells them to have great joy and notice that the things of this world will pass away, but what you will have in Christ will always be with you. In this world, and more importantly, we'll have it in perfection in the world to come. Your faith is more precious than the riches of this world. And as we celebrate Advent and we think of the grand themes that are before us of the hope, joy, and peace, and love, we know that this way of joy is for us even now. Always rejoicing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We lit this candle to remember that Christ brings the promise of new life a life in which the blind receive sight, the lame walk, and the prisoners are set free. We lit it to remember that he is the one who brings true and everlasting joy. That's what the Dalton family just read to you as our call to worship this morning, the reminder of what we have. And so our passage of scripture we'll use as our close. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you'll have it now And more importantly, you'll enjoy it forevermore in the presence of the Lord. Let's pray.